Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Roeder. I'm a communications consultant for AtVed, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Today, we'll learn about diagnostic tools for EOE with a focus on the esophageal string test from Dr. Shauna Schroeder. Dr. Schroeder is a pediatric gastroenterologist at Phoenix Children's Hospital, where she started the multidisciplinary eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease clinic. She has interest in less invasive esophageal surveillance, which is part of why she's joining us today. Welcome, Dr. Schroeder. Thank you. Good morning for everyone that's on the West Coast and good afternoon for everyone who's on the East Coast and everyone in between. Hello. Um, I really want to thank AFED for this opportunity to give this webinar this um, afternoon and really go over the who, the what, and why of less invasive monitoring for eosinophilic esophagitis. And again, I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist. I have been practicing in Phoenix for the last decade and for the last nine years um, as co-directing our eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease program with my allergist um, and nutritionist. Um, I, in the last two to three years, have been doing more less invasive monitoring for eosinophilic esophagitis. And I've started a um, unsedated transnasal endoscopy clinic, as well as more recently, an esophageal string clinic. Let's see why this isn't, there we go. So disclosures, I have no financial conflicts with Enterotrack, and I'm currently a consultant for Evo Endo. The objectives for today are to overview our less invasive devices that are currently available to us, to go through the history of the esophageal string test. Um, I'm gonna show a video that's provided from EnteroTracker, the EnteroTracker device, as well as go through a few of my patients who have administered the esophageal string test and how it's fine-tuned their treatment, as well as going through what to expect and how we set up our clinic at Phoenix Children's, as well as a brief slide just currently on our patient experience at Phoenix Children's, um, not yet published data. So I think the first question, which is really important to ask is why do we need less invasive testing for EOE? <laughs> Um, currently, this was a meta-analysis that was published in June of 2023. It looked at 40 studies and almost 150,000 patients with eosinophilic esophagitis from 15 countries and across five continents. It looked at the global incidence and global prevalence of eosinophilic esophagitis from 1976 to 2022. One can see that from 1976 to 2001, that there was an 8.18 case per 100,000 inhabitant years for EOE. And that has significantly increased when we look at the time period between 2017 and 2022. One can assume with the increase in disease prevalence this will also increase the disease burden from a treatment standpoint. Having a less invasive test for, control, for continued surveillance of our patients is great for our patients, families, and the medical system overall. Remember at variable intervals, you all as patients and families are needing to come to the hospital or to an outpatient surgical center. You're missing work, you're missing school, you're missing your activities, you're having to fast for eight hours, you're needing to be exposed to anesthetic and potential increased risk with a procedure, and this overall is costing you and the system time and money. So what is available for less invasive testing for EOE? I think it's important to familiarize ourselves with the current available technologies and definitions so we can understand the differences between these modalities. The UTNE or unsedated transnasal endoscopy includes both the use of a flexible bronchoscope as well as the new Evo Endo Ultra Slim transnasal 
esophagogastrojuvenoscopy scope. Both of these will actually provide samples of tissue of the mucosa. They also potentially can provide fluid samples. The flexible bronchoscope is limited though, however, to just being able to visualize well the esophagus as well as taking biopsies there. Whereas the ultra slim scope, one could actually do a full EGD with biopsy. The other part is that the EVO endoscope is single use and disposable, allowing much more flexibility to where we wanna provide and perform the procedure itself. So what I have my patients do is that they'll be fasting for two hours. They'll come into our outpatient clinic setting. They'll get consented and review what the procedure is about. I'll administer topical lidocaine as well as afrin to the nose for numbing. And then I'll insert this scope through the nasal passage, passing through the adenoids and upper pharynx, and then visualizing the upper esophageal sphincter, having patients swallow, and then being able to pass that scope into the esophagus or further into the stomach and small intestine. Occasionally, my patients will have gagging or vomiting, but often is rare and well tolerated. The typical age of my patients has been between eight and older. I'm often using um, VR goggles for dissociation and distraction techniques, but really younger patients have been reported that, to tolerate this procedure. It takes about five to 10 minutes, but does require a specialist like a GI doctor in order to take samples. In comparison to our um, traditional endoscopy, it is much less, about a third of the cost, but is more costly than the other um, non-invasive devices. The esophageal string test, which we'll talk about, um, I'll talk about my, my experience through the, the rest of the presentation about that. But briefly, we also have the cytosponge, which also provides fluid samples. Again, this is approved in 18 and older. Some of the adverse events have been gagging or sore throat. There could be some pharyngeal bleed or trauma. And then there has been occasion where the sponge has detached. But the way that the cytosponge sponge works is what um, has been for specifically looking at mucosal brushings and sampling of our patients with EOE and Barrett's. And there was a published study in 2017 by Katzka et al. that looked at the accuracy and safety of the cytosponge sponge for assessing histologic activity in EOE. And this was a two-center study. It used a cutoff of less than 15 eosinophils per high power field for inactive disease. And the sensitivity and specificity of the cytosponge sponge was 75% and 86% respectively. For the biopsies with inactive EOE, the cytosponge sponge was able to identify 38 out of the 44 patients. And in this study, the cytosponge sponge was successfully able to obtain adequate tissue samples in 95% of our EOE patients with 80% accuracy when you compared it to the gold standard, which is biopsies. So these are pictures of our current non-invasive testing modalities. So here you could appreciate the disposable EVO endoscope. It's a long, flexible scope. Here is a patient who's being distracted. And you can visualize what we're actually seeing when we're in your when you're in the patient's esophagus here. This is an example of the esophageal string test. This is a capsule that has a string that's rolled up into it. And this is really the device itself, which is the nylon string. And then here is the cytosponge. sponge. You can see that the sponge is rolled up within the capsule, it's swallowed. And then once that capsule dissolves, the deployment of the sponge itself. So one thing about medicine that I love is the thoughtful innovation and reuse and repurpose of already developed technologies used for other screening and diseases. So this is a perfect example. The Enterotest was a gelatin coated capsule 
with a nylon stream, which would get swallowed. And as the capsule dissolved, the stream deployed into the distal end of the small bowel where microbes could attach. So one can see that this was published in 1974. And this was a previous screening test for Giardia infections. In 2011, there was a publication which was monitoring biliary drugs with the use of the enterotype. Fast forward, it brings us to over the last decade in which the device is now being used as esophageal surveillance and is now called the esophageal string test. When I was a fellow in Denver, this technology was being used as a research tool and proof of concept until it was FDA approved device. The initial ESTs or esophageal string tests were performed on 41 children ages seven to 20 with active EUE, EUE that was in remission, they had patients with GERD and then control patients. The EST was administered as a non-invasive test to correlate with the timing of the patient's biopsies and endoscopies. The presence of eosinophil proteins in the secretions is reflective of the mucosal inflammation that's seen in EOE by specifically measuring eosinophil proteins. This includes major basic protein, eosinophil-derived neurotoxin, eosinophilic cationic proteins, eosinophil peroxidates, and charcoat lidin crystal proteins. Patients would swallow the string the night before their endoscopies, and then the morning of their procedure, they would have it removed at the same time of getting their biopsies. The results, there was a high correlation of the biopsy findings to the findings that were on the string. Other luminal contents can also be measured on the string, including the esophageal microbiome. This study compared the biopsy and string tests with specific microbial populations, which correlated well in our EOE and in our normal patients. Both of these studies bolstering the old intero test to a promising new esophageal string test. This was the published data in looking at the minimally invasive test that accurately detected the disease in EOE with a one hour string test and has how I've been utilizing the test to this point. Here's the video. The Enero Tracker, a string-based capsule device about the size of a jelly bean, offers a minimally invasive collection of upper gastrointestinal mucosal samples. Within just a few minutes, the string is secured, the patient swallows the capsule, and the collection string continuously unravels, reaching the upper small intestine as the capsule dislodges. Patients relax comfortably while the collection device remains in the GI tract. The string's unique design allows it to absorb mucosal content into its inner matrix, protected from contamination. To retrieve the sample, the clinician gently pulls the string in one smooth motion. The clinician identifies regions of the string that correspond to discrete sections of the GI tract using pH and distance markings. A preservation solution is provided to store the regions of the string chosen for analysis. The liquid biopsy sample can be analyzed by reference labs for various disease markers. The Enero Tracker is an innovative solution to collect samples safely and simply from the upper GI tract. So I'll often actually show my patients that video in clinic. Um, so they get an idea of whether they'd be able to tolerate um, and swallow the, the pill itself. So I guess this leads us to the last is who is a candidate for less invasive testing for EOE? So really it depends on the patient's tolerance, their current symptoms. I always ask, well, how are your current EOE symptoms? Mild, then I'll offer a less invasive test or if they're asymptomatic. If they're having severe symptoms, 
I'll often want biopsies or better evaluation with an endoscopic approach. But I could also invite, you know, an unsedated transnasal endoscopy if need be where I could take tissue. For the string itself, can you swallow a pill is a big question. A lot of our patients with EOE can't swallow pills. So in the clinic prior to the visit, I'll often ask them to practice with a Mike and Ike or a jelly bean to practice swallowing their pills. Another important question that I'll ask is, have you already had a diagnostic endoscopy with biopsies? This is not a replacement for our diagnostic scopes, but I think is a really great alternative for surveillance and changes in treatment. And I think like any procedure, making sure you're consistent with your treatment. As your physicians, you're sort of an experiment in the way that if you're taking your med, taking your diet, prescribed appropriately, when we do a procedure, gives us a lot of information. But if only taking our medication once a day or missing 50% of it, it doesn't really allow for us to capture that information. And then specifically for the t &E, the major question I ask patients are, can you tolerate nasal sprays? If you allow me to be near your nose or in your nose, at eight or nine, you could be easily distracted with VR goggles. It's just a matter of letting me spend five minutes in your nose. I recently had one of my colleagues perform a transnasal endoscopy on me, um, and I found that the lidocaine was the most difficult part of the procedure and that it was bitter, but I often will use a candy spray to mask that taste for our patients. But as far as tolerating passage through the nose or back down the throat, it really was minimally discomforting and could be really well tolerated by both adults and pediatric patients. So these are examples of some patients that I've actually used the string on in clinic. So we'll go through some case examples um, and then um, a little bit more data that way. So MM is a 16-year-old male with the initial symptoms of dysphagia. He has it worse with chicken and has associated regurgitation, nausea symptoms. He underwent a diagnostic um, sedated endoscopy in January of 2023 with gross findings of edema and furrows and biopsies that had 20 to 25 eosinophils per high power field in the distal, mid, and proximal esophagus. He started on high dose PPI for two months. He did have similar symptoms, um, but we decided to place an esophageal string test. The results, this is what comes back from the lab once it's sent. And it shows that there's the reference of less than 15 eosinophils per high power field is 0.53. So anything higher than that would indicate more than 15 eosinophils. So his EOE score was high. So the, a score of one with the probability of having EOE. With the active EOE score, we switched his treatments to Dupexit, and he did have complete resolution of his symptoms. And just last week, we repeated the esophageal string test after he had been on Dupexit weekly for five months. So currently, I'm just waiting for his string results to come back. Another patient, she was a 14 year old, she is a 14 year old female with oral allergy syndrome, eczema, abdominal pain, and nausea symptoms. Symptoms intermittent for the last two years. She had an EGD with biopsies and endoscopy confirming the diagnosis of EOE with 35 to 80 eosinophils per high power field, basal zone hyperplasia and microabscesses were seen grossly, and this was on a scope in February of 2023. She was started on high-dose PPI treatment and had clinical improvement in symptoms. We repeated a, with a surveillance with a string test instead of a sedated scope in April of 2023. 
And here again, the results show that her EOE score that had a low probability of ha having active eosinophilic esophagitis when we compare it to the reference range. Our plan now is to continue our current treatment with high dose PPI and repeat an esophageal string in 15 months to 24 months unless her symptoms change sooner or we want to change treatment course. So Again, this is an example of using the string as a follow-up from our diagnostic biopsies. Here was a 19-year-old female with a history of EUE diagnosed in June of 2018. And her EGD with biopsies had over 100 eosinophils per high power field in the distal, mid, and proximal esophagus. We repeated her EGD with biopsies on high-dose PPI, and this was done in 2018, and she had remission of her EOE with two eosinophils per high-power field in the distal and proximal esophagus. I saw her in clin up, clinic for follow-up recently, and she had some increased nausea symptoms, but we thought it was likely more attributed to the new vitamins she was taking and had no associated dysphagia or heartburn. Um, which was her initial symptoms. She had been on continued high-dose PPI um, for twice a day, and um, we did a surveillance with an esophageal string test at that time in October of 2022. And then again, it showed that her EOE score was low and that her risk or probability of having active EOE was unlikely. Because she was doing so well, she was interested in decreasing her PPI to daily. And last week, we repeated an esophageal string test. And again, I'm waiting for those results. But this is an example of how we could potentially fine tune our treatment with using less invasive testing and not needing to go under a sedated procedure. I think this is our last patient, but this is an example of a food eliminated patient. So he's an 11 year old male with a history of chronic EOE. He was diagnosed at two years of age. He was on food elimination for his primary treatment and has been very slow to do food trials and reintroduction of foods because of needing frequent sedated endoscopies. At some point in his treatment, he was recommended only to eat fruits and veggies in 2016. And all fruits and vegetables, um, no legumes or beans at that time. He initially added rice back in, in 2016, and he passed that. He had potatoes added in 2016 and passed that. Coconut in 2017, beef in 2018, eggs in 2019, chicken in 2019, peanut in 2020, almond in 2021, pea in 2021. And again, you can see here with the sedated scopes, it was really just one to two foods per year versus now having the availability of the esophageal stream test since October of 2022. He's been successfully able to introduce turkey, soy, fish, and the plan, if his string from last week comes back normal, would be to do legumes and beans. So this is now introduction of four foods per year with less invasive monitoring. So what to expect? So I tell my patients they need to avoid eating solids two hours prior and drinking one hour prior to placement, really to prevent and if there's any gagging or vomiting for the food to be coming back up. I often tell patients that the office time will be 70 to 90 minutes and really they have to have the ability to swallow a capsule the size of a jelly bean or mic in a mic. And if they cannot swallow a pill, likely won't be able to proceed um, with the procedure. The string will dwell in the esophagus for 60 minutes. So making sure that they understand that they will have the sensation of something there. And that once it's removed, that I'll process it in the clinic. And then I send it to a reference lab for EOE biomarkers. 
And this relatively has been taking anywhere between 10 and 14 days. The lab report will come back, which you saw, which was the EOE score. And it's a quantitative measure of disease activity and having this cutoff of 15 knees in the fills per high power field. I always discuss with the family that the sensitivity and specificity of testing is 80% sensitive and 75% specificity. So it was a really great screening tool, but not 100% on like biopsies. So this was provided um, by the Entero Tracker Company. So this is our EOE score, and it was able to clearly define inactive disease, which are the green dot plotted patients here, compared to those with active disease. Here's that cutoff reference at 0 0.530. So again, less than is patients having inactive disease and those that had higher scores having active disease. And this was 46 patients. So our experience at Phoenix Children's, when looking at, I think, starting a new clinic or providing new innovation to the hospital or private practice, one needs to really look at the budgets and costs of staffing the specialty clinics the availability of the equipment. For example, if you're planning on doing a transnasal endoscopy, are you gonna do it in the outpatient clinic, in your surgical center? Are you gonna need sterilization equipment for your bronchoscopes? Or can you use the single use EVO endoscope doing it in the outpatient center? Are there staff to help with either obtaining samples and biopsies? Or do you have the appropriate equipment for storage, like freezers, someone helping to package up the samples and send that out of your institution or clinic? So the way that we've worked it is that the strings, I'll order it as a procedure outpatient. Um, my scheduler will get prior authorization and then counsel families that if insurance doesn't cover the string prior to the visit, um, that there usually is um, a cost potentially, not more than usually $500 to the families or patient. There is a string lab code for the assessment, um, which is a 0095U, um, which I will click when I'm doing the billing part of things. Um, but then I will set up a specific esophageal cl clinic where I'll see patients back to back to back and just place strings all morning. And usually we'll have about eight to 10 patients, eight to 12 patients in a setting for the day. Um, I have a medical assistant who's pretty amazing. Um, so no nursing staff that I'll use that day in clinic and we'll check patients in and do a height and weight. I start off the visit by making sure patients are taking their medications, finding out what their current symptoms are. So almost like a office, short office visit. And then we'll have the patient swallow the string. Then they'll go to the waiting room while they'll wait there for uh, an hour. Um, I also have staff from the lab that will come up. They will help with the collection of the sample of the string itself, and they'll immediately freeze that. And then once batched, they'll send that out to the reference lab in Denver, Colorado. I also offer research. We're an academic center. So um, if we're collecting a portion of a string, we'll do that with the research and lab coordinator as well. So physically of the day of this clinic, my, the patients will see me, will review their symptoms, my MA is helping, and then I have a lab and research coordinator that's helping. So from a physical aspect, patients will swallow the string. Um, usually what I will do is pull the string out about five centimeters um, and, and we'll end up taping that end to the patient's cheek but I will often hold on to that end of the string because I don't want it to be completely swallowed. And then I allow my patients to manage their water bottles when they're taking um, a drink of the pill itself to pass. Um, besides having um, 
I have a chair where the patients are sitting. I also have spit basins in case there's regurgitation or vomiting. I cover the patient in a towel in case they regurgitate up the water or the string is to avoid them to getting wet. And then there are pill taking cups that sometimes I'll try if the patient's having a really hard time getting the pill down themselves that we'll use. And I found those off of Amazon. You gotta love Amazon. Uh, and um, really um, once the patient has swallowed a string, you'll often feel this tug, um, which is really the peristalsis of the string moving down from the esophagus into the stomach itself. Um, I'll tape the end of the string to the cheek with a half a tegaderm. I don't adhere it super tight because probably the most uncomfortable thing about it is getting the tape off. Um, but then I'll mark the corner of their mouth with um, a Sharpie so I know where um, to lay the string out when I'm measuring for the esophageal length. Typically, I will have the patients try up to three devices. Um, if they can't get the third device down, we'll usually not do um, the string that day. Sometimes if I have a patient who will gag, um, I will make sure that I'm talking to them, telling them to take deep breaths. As the pill finally passes from the esophagus to the stomach, usually that gag is much better for them and that will calm down that response. Um, often I'll have children um, sit on their hands. Um, this is when um, they're swallowing the pill potentially, but more often when I'm pulling the string out as to avoid reflexively trying to grab at the string um, and, and contaminate the string that you just wanted to collect. Um, I have a, I'll show a picture at the end, but I have a cutting board where I adhered the um, measuring stick to, and I will use that as laying out the string. And I'll often use the esophageal height equation instead of using pH, because many of our patients are also on antacids. So sometimes teasing out where the esophagus is, differentiating between the stomach can be difficult. Um, but I will use a height. There's a height calculation for your pediatric patients as well as your adult patients. And we'll often use that. So string tests by age, this was provided again by Enterotrack, but um, they had one four to five-year-old patient, uh, five to 10 years of age, they had 15 patients, 10 years to 13 years of age, 23 patients, 13 years to 16 years, 21 patients, and over 16 years, um, there was 20 patients that have undergone string tests. And this was as of August of 2023. So our experience currently, um, as of September of 2023, we've done 70 strings. All were screening for EOE. And the age range of patients were nine to 20 years of age. The average office visit for us was 72 minutes. This was ranging really 65 minutes. And that was in a patient who had already done this a few times. And he sort of was in and out swallowing the pill um, to 86 minutes. For our patients, um, keeping track of what has happened as they swallow the pills, 36 of them had no complications um, to report. Um, 22 of the patients had gagging, seven had vomiting or regurgitation up of the string itself. Um, and then there were four failed attempts where patients just refused or couldn't get the string down. We had 13 repeat patients. And then as far as deploying or unraveling the strings that didn't fully unravel, we had four of those. Um, this year, there is a newer string that is shorter and hopefully will mitigate the um, knotting or wrapping up of the string within the capsule itself, not allowing for the string to fully unravel in the esophagus. 
I also had one patient who, when he was swallowing the string, the string got wrapped around his upper retainer. So we had to cut that string and then he needed to swallow another string that way. So I, this is the board, the cutting board that we'll use. So um, this was an example of a string that didn't fully deploy that I had sent to the, a picture to the company, but usually you'll see where I've marked it um, from the, the cheek, the corner of the mouth and placing it at zero. Um, and then the first seven centimeters really is the string that's in the mouth. So we don't send that part because it's not in the esophagus. And then we cut down to where the end of the esophagus is based on their height here. So again, you need scissors, um, tegaderm to tape the string to the cheek, um, as well as tweezers to help sort of lay out the string on the cutting board and then making sure you have cleanser to um, clean off the cutting board if you're gonna do this in a outpatient clinic setting like we're doing. So um, thanks. Um, I guess I'll take any questions. I think that Jennifer's probably moderating all the questions. Alrighty, so we've got a number of good questions coming in today. Again, as a reminder, if you have a question, please click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and please type it in there. We're not taking questions verbally, but we are going to read off questions as they come in. Alrighty, so the first question we've got um, is one that I might be able to help answer. Is there a way for us to find practitioners in our areas who offer less invasive diagnostic procedures? So I'll let you answer first and then I'll, I'll share some resources from AppVet. So I, I actually don't know the answer to that. I mean, I know that there are centers throughout the country that are doing transnasal endoscopy. Um, and uh, I'm not sure who everyone else is using string or adults that are using cytosponge or not clinically. So uh, I think I'm gonna leave that question to you. <laughs> Alrighty. So AppBed hosts a specialist finder on its website at appbed.org slash specialist. Within that, it is a self-reported database of clinicians that treat eosinophil-associated disorders. We are working on adding a new feature to it to be able to track and let people know about uh, monitoring tools like this. Um, so stay tuned for that to get added to the specialist finder, but feel free to use the specialist finder to find clinicians around the world that, that support patients with eosinophilic disorders. Awesome, Alrighty. So a lot of the esophageal string test has to do with being able to swallow a pill. And so we're getting questions about that pill. You've talked a little bit about how people can practice. Is there anyone someone could work with if they're not able to swallow a pill to be able to learn how to do that? I, I would probably look on YouTube. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think the nurses, you know, obviously there are kids that are much younger that have um, you know, other conditions that need to have, take lots of pills, right? And so mm -hmm. I know that nursing staff or potentially child life, if you have child life in your practice that can help with that. I think the hard part about swallowing pills is that our patients with EOE have dysphagia and they often have a hard time swallowing pills. So it, it is a, ch a challenge when you already at baseline have difficulty swallowing pills. Um, sometimes when their disease is better controlled, um, they can get practice and it's easier for them to do that um, with, the, with the capsule once their disease is better. Um, but yeah, I think talking, if you have a child life or a nurse in your practice that's really good at teaching how to swallow pills, maybe they're, and like I said, if there's some sort of self-directed thing on YouTube or something where they teach patients how to swallow pills. But the pill cup is a great option too. Um, and again, you sit the pill in the top of this plastic cup and you can just swallow it and tip your head back with the drinking of the water. And then what I do is untape the pill that I stuck to it and then tape it to their cheek before it completely clears their throat. Very interesting. I've also heard some feeding specialists talk that when they work with children, they will help in part of their practice help um, patients learn how to swallow pills. So if you work with a feeding specialist, feel free to ask them for advice as well. Awesome, alrighty. So we've got some questions coming in here about um, 
what happens if you accidentally swallow the entire string? So the entire string will just be pooped out. There is a metal ball that's wrapped up with the nylon string um, and that will get passed in the stool. You won't ever see it, it's teeny tiny. And that is weighted so that the string act and the capsule actually goes down into the, passes the esophagus. So, um, and like the capsule dissolves very quickly. It's a vegetable derivative now. Previously it was a gelatin coated capsule. Um, but that that coating really dissolves quickly. So it, you're going to already poop out a little ball. If you have to poop out a nylon string, you poop out a nylon string. So um, no issues if, if that happens. So then we've also got some questions coming in about the difference between a string test and the unsedated CME. Could you talk a little bit about the differences and when you would recommend one or the other to a patient? Yeah, so when I have patients that have more symptoms, so if they have some moderate dysphagia symptoms and previously were doing really well, and let's say they were on swallowed steroids for their treatment, and I want to know if they have a yeast infection, right? Canada is one of the risks with topical viscous budesonide. So in those cases, I'm going to offer a, a transnasal endoscopy because I really want biopsies. I really want to look at the surface of the esophagus while I'm in there. And so in those cases, I'll want tissue. Um, in patients that have a lot of heartburn symptoms, um, a lot of regurgitation symptoms, um, I sometimes will want tissue also as if I'm sort of determining, do they also have reflux disease on top of their EOE and not just you know, untreated EOE. So in those cases, I'm able to actually look at the lower part of the esophagus and take biopsies, as well as looking at the top part. Um, currently, right now, I'm not dividing the string up into a proximal portion and a distal portion of the string. Potentially, you could um, to sort of tease out. But um, again, the cost of the string really is based on the lab analysis. Um, from that standpoint. We've got a lot of questions coming in about the cost. Um, mm -hmm. So while I recognize that it's not your area of expertise, um, where would you recommend people find more information about how much it would cost to, for the patient to be able to get the, the procedure done? I, I would refer to the company itself to see if the an, uh, tracker company has someone that can walk patients through it. Um, I know that in our facility, you know, um, it's a build code for an office visit. So it's, you're really just getting charged your office visit with my, with myself. So just like a typical follow-up visit, but it's the cost of the analysis of the string in which, you know, whether your insurance or won't, your insurance won't pick up it, and that, <clears throat> And I believe, like I said, it, it is not more than $500. Do you happen to know if it's out, available outside of the United States? I don't know. Okay, something to learn. Alrighty, you talked a lot about the scores and it was really interesting to see that chart about what you're able to learn from the different scores. Um, someone's really curious if they had a score of 0.53, what would that mean? So yeah. like, because yeah. there's such a, a variable in things, like what happens if you're right in the middle? So uh, um, I have a perfect example of a patient like that. She was on a two food elimination and her score was like 0.8 um, when we did this string. So we changed her treatment. She went to a four food elimination and um, her then her next score was 0.8. I think it was like 0.57. And so it was better, but it still had active. So she then was switched to swallowed flow vent and her score was exactly 0.53. So what we've decided, um, uh, because clinically she's doing so much better, um, is that in three to six months, we're actually gonna repeat a scope 
on the current treatment. So I actually can get biopsies and look to see what's happening at the tissue. So again, there are some occasions where you may just have to, again, go back to your traditional endoscopy. This is not to replace it. This is to use with it. And I think is great when we're trying to really fine tune our treatment, when we're doing a, a simple surveillance in a patient that maybe have already had uh, a biopsy showing that their current treatment is working really well. So I think it's those sort of figuring out what exactly, what information you're needing. But yeah, if there's someone on the borderline, uh, I still am going to want to know if they're clearly in remission or not um, at some point. So there's a number of different uh, things that get looked at when you're doing the full scope. Um, and when you're doing the string test, you've talked about the EOE biomarkers. Is there anything else that gets looked at beyond an EOE biomarker when you're sending things off to the lab? Currently for the reference lab, they're really looking for EOE, but like that study, um, you know, looking at luminal properties, you could look at really any sort of protein bound um, luminal secretion. So we they looked at microbiome. So you could actually measure bacterial concentrations in patients with EOE compared to reflux, compared to normal. So we know you can measure other things on the string. Um, but for right now, when you're sending it to the lab, they're really specifically looking at eosinophil proteins. And I believe you may have shared this before, but can you repeat for everyone watching today, how long does it take to get the test results? So the, I know that they've been trying to batch them um, and run them so they have enough of them at the same time to batch and send out. So when I do my big clinic, I'm usually getting it back anywhere between 7 and 14 days is what I tell my families. So an elimination diet is something you've talked about a number of times today. People are curious, um, would you mind sharing a little bit about the approach for an elimination diet and how long it might be used for? So um, currently right now in our practice, we're usually, if we're going to talk about food elimination diet outside of their true food allergies or IgE immediate allergies, we're looking at one food elimination or two food with first being cow's milk protein and then potentially wheat. Um, and so that's usually our approach in our multidisciplinary clinic at this point. Is it something that once someone's on an elimination diet that they should stay on it forever? Or are there cases where somebody can, uh, the example that they're asking is, can you make an exception when you're traveling or when you're a guest in someone's home? like and still receive remission, like how strict do you have to be with an elimination diet? Um, so I think it's a slippery slope that like if you start having an activity or a celebration on a weekly basis that you're really not gonna end up being on a, an elimination diet. But of course, if there's like a birthday party and there's not like a true food allergy and you want you know, to enjoy your cake or something for the day, that's fine. But I, I think that's sort of where that slippery slope comes into play. We always talk about shared decision-making with our patients. Because you start an elimination diet at age seven doesn't mean at 17 that that's what you want to still do. And so there are some new, you know, great treatments, right? We've got, you know, antacids that 30 to 50% of our patients respond to. We've got swallowed steroids that 70% of our patients respond to. And we've got Dupexit now, which is approved for us, which is our only FDA approved drug that, you know, is about nine, over 90% responsive. So we, I always tell families and patients, if this is not working for you, there is alternatives. So like, let's talk about what's going to work for you and your current lifestyle at this point in time. Have you ever encountered someone getting the capsule stuck when swallowing, for example, due to a narrowed esophagus? So I typically, if they're having severe dysphagia symptoms, I'm not doing the string. So it's not recommended if you have an esophageal stricture currently. You're going to want to have a sedated scope and be dilated or have an endo flip at the same time to be evaluated. Um, 
potentially you could do the ultra slim just to take a look because it is a very narrow diameter. Um, but I usually am doing a sedated endoscopy with patients that have uh, an active stricture. Um, the capsule itself dissolves really quickly. So the string is, a you, you can see the picture is a teeny nylon string. So that won't, that's not getting stuck in the esophagus that way. Okay. So, so you've talked about who's not the ideal candidate. Could you reiterate for us who are the ideal candidates to use the string test? I really think like if it's not a diagnostic scope, so you're not, this is not for diagnosis um, and this is more for follow-up. You're not having severe dysphagia symptoms. You're able to swallow a pill or you're able to be, you know, tolerating nasal sprays. I really think this can be offered to anyone from that standpoint. Um, and it's just walking through with your patients or talking to the families that these are the options that you have. But again, if you're thinking that they have a, you know, an infection that's, you know, going on, and you want tissue and probably doing a transnasal scope. If you're concerned that they have overlap reflux disease, you probably want tissue. Again, unsedated is fine, um, but you want tissue. And then, um, you know, if they have severe gagging and vomiting, they may not do well with the string. Um, because there will be that sensation of having that string sitting there for an hour. Um, I've had a few patients that have a large gag reflex and they did better with the transnasal just because they may have had a little gagging when I passed it through the upper esophagus, but it wasn't still sitting there causing them to have like retching and gagging. Um, so, but Again, I think having the availability of these less invasive testing modalities is just a big game changer for our patients, um, especially when we're doing surveillance or fine tuning their treatment. Well, thank you so much for such a great presentation today. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about string tests? Um, I'll keep you guys posted. I'm hoping that we are able to publish some of our, our experience um, on the patients that we've done so far. And, um, you know, we I just wanna really continue to grow our program um, and have this available for our patients. And hopefully I could spread the wealth of knowledge to patients to be able to ask their providers if they, know more about this, or they can bring this into their practice, and then also, you know, further educating other practices and wanting to bring this to their institutions or private practices, too. Well, thank you so much for all that you're doing to help people learn about it and to help further the research. We really appreciate it. Thank you again for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We also want to make sure we take time to thank our education partners for their support of this webinar series. Thank you to Bristol Myers Squibb, to GSK, and to Santa Fe and Regeneron. To continue learning about the eosinophil associated diseases, we encourage you to check out our podcast, Real Talk Eosinophilic Diseases. As it so happens, our latest episode, we talked to Dr. Stephen Ackerman and Robin Shandis about the esophageal string test. So we encourage you to have a listen and hear about how this test was developed and, and more details about the same discussion we had today. You can find the episode at atbed.org slash podcast, as well as on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible, and more. Another great opportunity to learn about eosinophilic disorders is our annual patient education conference, EOS Connection 2023. Yes, the dates you see on the screen are past, but all of the sessions were recorded and they're available to watch on demand through the end of the year. So head over to atfed.org slash conference and atfed members can register for virtual access for free. Finally, we encourage you to continue the discussion started today in our online community on the Inspire Network. It's a great place to connect with other patients and caregivers for support. You can check it out at atbed.org slash connections. So thank you again to everyone for joining us today and especially to Dr. Schroeder for her presentation. If you have a question that didn't get answered today, please email mail at atbed.org. Have a great afternoon.